So welcome everybody to whatever week number we're on, probably like 13 or something, um, to this meeting with MM with our special guest today, Paul Mento. Um, Paul today is going to talk through some different mixing techniques, um, specifically a more uh, pop and hip hop kind of thing where if you're given, given a limited amount of tracks or something like that, a situation that's not exactly ideal and you have to make do with what you have in this certain genre. Um, and we'll jump from a couple different techniques to some other things, but, uh, without blabbering too much longer, I will we'll let Paul take this away. How do you do everybody? Um, yeah, so like Grant said, one of the things that, um, we're really going to touch on, and I actually brought two tracks that we can work on one that already has kind of like a, a format ingrained in it that I've kind of replicated, um, that we're gonna go over each component, why it's done, um, what effect does it have? Uh, and then a second one, which we'll kind of build from the ground up, which is completely dry as recorded. Um, note both of these tracks were um, uh, completed and they were also granted permission for use. I just have to state that for legal reasons. <laughs> um, cool, so this first track that we're looking at, um, this is by an artist from York, um, young kid, probably around 15, 16. So the story behind this one, uh, this was actually not recorded at my studio nor um, the studio in Lancaster that I currently work with. Um, this was actually sent to us with probably the biggest uh, no-no when sending stems has all of the effects already on the voice. So if we listen to just the vocals on here, this blind. I ain't never been a rag, better check my background. I ain't never let a rag who was around come around. You, you can hear that it's all, it's already decked out with delay throws, with reverb, with all kinds of real wonkiness. Um, so really the question is, how can you mix this? How can you make it sound better? Because um, I do have the original reference, which we'll, we'll take a listen to before we dive into exactly what we're doing. And then we'll compare what we've done to the reference at the end of it. Um, we're going to kind of see like what was an issue that was present in the original mix. Why is the artist deciding that the other mix wasn't satisfactory and then wants me to redo it? Um, and then how we're going to go through tackling those kind of things. So take a quick second. Let's just listen to a little bit of the um, the original reference that I have here. Um, we'll kind of listen to it for maybe 30 seconds or so. Try and pick out some of the big key things that we're going to see over the entire scope of the entire song. Um, and then we'll get into, you know, from the ground up, what, what we usually start with um, and then how we attack each thing all the way to the end. Steph got the waves. Hey, yo, Lorenz, what you doing? Look, I ain't even gonna start. My bitch won't be nothing too big. Yeah, but I love this shit. Blind, yeah, I'm smoking rice. I don't give a fuck what you tryna say. You ain't hitting this blind. I ain't never been a rag, better check my background. I ain't never let a rag who wasn't around come around. You say you will take what look, we in town. No, we not lagging, like pistol back and blowing down. I fuck six up in this bitch. Cool. So one of the big things that, at least for myself, um, and whether or not I'm not exactly sure how clearly it comes through Zoom, but there's a lot of high-end clutter. So typically when we're talking about, especially working within, I'm just going to use modern day pop um, and especially in hip hop. Usually when we're looking at how we want our frequency spread, kind of spread across, obviously you want your lows, you want your sub and everything sat right in the middle. Um, you want your vocals kind of floating just above that when we're thinking about, you know, how stuff is perceived volume wise throughout a mix. Um, and then you also want your, your high end stuff. So your high hats, your, if you have any like high um, kind of ad libs in the background um, not vocal ad-libs, but other kind of melodic elements. You want them kind of sitting up with the voice um, so that there's something in parallel that you can you can listen to throughout. And that's what kind of gives hip-hop tracks, as simple as they are, their space compared to something maybe more dense, like a metal track or something like that, which may have two guitars, an entire drum kit, etc. Um, 
so the first thing that I kind of deal with is about how am I going to pretty much take this apart without the ability to actually take it apart. So I usually start first, which I'll, I'll look at the beat first. So the beat that we were given, which is extremely typical, is a beat that some artists will get either off of Beat Stars, shout out Michael Klein, or um, they'll get it off of YouTube. Um, and usually they'll come in or they'll email a track in and they'll bring it on USB and it's just some beat off of YouTube, um, which is already consolidated. So it's not broken down into individualized stems, leaving us kind of limited with what we can do. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't do anything at all. Um, so the first thing that I do, as you see, is I'll usually just attack the beat head on first and I'll use kind of some EQ. So what I'm kind of doing in all of these is I'm setting it up for I'm setting it up for a kind of technique that I use which kind of separates the high end from the rest of the beat entirely. Um, which will allow me to sonically create a shape that the listener will hear so that I can place exactly where I want the vocals to be in the mix. Um, especially with a mix like this, where I don't have control over spatially the effects on the vocals itself. Um, this is kind of a crucial tool, at least, that I see that works not only in this, but in other, um, other songs as well. So if we listen to the beat, without any effects on it. You kind of hear it doesn't really have a whole lot there. It's not a whole lot of color. There are definitely a lot of other elements um, in there, but you know, it needs to be shaped. It needs to be colorized. It needs to just be a little bit prepared for the vocals that are going to sit on top of it. The vocals as of right now would kind of overwhelm and not feel like a complete portion of the actual song. So first thing that I do is usually I try and shape the low end a little bit better. The reason I usually shape the low end with the EQ in such a fashion I'm doing right now is because the next step which is going to be pretty much taking the track and almost creating a secondary output sum for it um, there's certain things that I do on that track, which we'll get to, which you can attack with several different plugins. Um, also, speaking of plugins, fun, fun little fact, this entire time I'm doing both of these songs, I'm going to try and do it entirely with um, stock Logic um, uh, plugins or free plugins so that, you know, y'all can try this on your own without the need to spend any money on plugins. Um, Cool. So we kind of shape the low end just a little bit. It's a lot easier to really, really hear this when you're working either with a subwoofer or you're working with some some nice monitors. Um, so we won't we won't be able to hear much of a difference through this zoom. Um, but usually the next thing that I'll attack is I'll kind of create this cutoff here. And usually I try and listen for where's the heart of the actual kick that's coming in itself. So I can kind of find if I'm listening to this. So I can kind of hear when I'm kind of scoping, I kind of started a little high, kind of like moving into our low mid kind of section and kind of working my way down, which typically, especially with hip hop beats that come from YouTube, um, you definitely want to start kind of above where you think the actual range of the kick or whatever lower element of the song you're trying to enhance and kind of work your way down. Because like I said, since this is a consolidated beat and we don't actually have the ability to take it apart and actually look at just at the kick itself, we need to keep in mind that, you know, Whatever broad frequency ranges we apply here, it's not just applying to the kick, it's applying to everything that lies within that specific range itself. Um, so kind of as I move closer down to about the, um, I move down to the uh, kind of bass starting to get down a little bit to the 100 hertz range, um, I can kind of hear that, that real heart, that real kind of 
uh, overdriven kick sound is starting to come out. And that's what I really want to work with um, moving on to the next step of working with this beat. So usually it's not too much of a bump that I usually give it, um, especially with the way that I have this kind of low shelf um, or in this case, a low roll off design. I can kind of, you know, afford to maybe give a little bit more gas, kind of give it a little bit more of a, um, a taper leading down into my low mids. Um, Cause that's, you don't really have to worry about it's really affecting it too much unless you have a beat that already has a lot of low mids present um, to begin with. So neat, so moving on. So now we're taking out a significant amount of the low mids. Um, there's a specific reason for this, like I said, that I will get to. Um, pretty much what I'm doing is I'm isolating and I'm consolidating my low end. Um, I'm pretty much carving out with this EQ exactly what I want to work with because spoiler alert, we're gonna be using a multi-presser in the next step to kind of help them take this beat and prepare it for the actual stereo spread, the actual imaging that I'm gonna be doing um, manually. So same process as I did before with the low end, um, with that kick sound, I kind of hover around, I try and find the real nastiness. Now there is gonna be kind of right above this region that you're gonna to wanna to cut out. There's gonna be some really nice, um, really nice kind of mid sound that you really want to keep because without that you kind of lose the kind of lower part of a person's voice. Um, not lower as in bass tone, but lower as in um, harmonically. Because every time you say something, you have a high, a mid, and a low that makes up the core of your voice. And then there's a bunch of other, you know, more calculated stuff in there that I don't want to get into. Um, but an easy way that you can really hear that um, and something that you can try right now if you want is try talking while putting pressure on your chest. You'll hear that your voice starts to get a little bit lower. Um, and then if you go right at the base of where your, your neck meets your chin, and you press on that, you'll hear kind of how the high, um, the high mids kind of start to creep in. And then same thing, if you move up and you press on your nose, we all know what that sounds like, but you're still talking, you're still using the same element of your voice. So with that in mind, I'm manipulating the beat so that I can do that because I know that the effects that are applied to the vocals in this track are already going to accentuate that um, as I move forward. So neat. Um, again, just like I did over here when shaping the subs, you want to do the exact same thing um, as needed, you know, uh, to kind of the, the upper mids, the high mid kind of stuff. These aren't drastic increases here. We're kind of using more of a subtractive mixing approach towards especially the beat in the beginning versus a very additive one. Because the last thing we want to do is add too many frequencies and then end up overwhelming the mix. Cool. And then we add a little bit of high end. Oh, that might actually be a little too much. We add a little bit of high end with using a high end shelf at the top because we want to try and capture all of that for the shaping that we're going to do um, when we get to the actual stereo spread of the high end. Cool. So we kind of have this, this framework done. We've kind of taken this rough sketch of the beat and we're, we've kind of manipulated it with the mindset of how we're going to add in the vocals later on. So this is kind of what we were working with before. So our goal is for it to not be extremely noticeable. You know, if we're really changing the contour, or we're really changing um, the actual sound of frequencies within our within our beat and making the beat sound completely different than it does before, we're kind of working negatively towards our end goal, which is really to clean this clean this track. Um, so you want to try and make stuff noticeable so that it cleans but you want it to be barely. So if you were to show this to your parents or show this to somebody who maybe doesn't have a trained ear for mixing, they shouldn't be able to tell exactly you know, what's missing, um, et cetera, which is gonna make our next step extremely easy. Cool. So moving on, our next step is I'm actually gonna send this to 
an auxiliary track, I'm going to use a bus as my output. I'm going to send this output somewhere else so it can extend through. The reason I do this um, is because I'm actually going to take the original beat itself and I'm going to use its high end unaffected by what I'm about to do um, to create that stereo spread of the high end to create that kind of bowl shape that I'm going to put the vocals in the center for. Cool. So I move this over here and now we're going to get kind of a little bit more aggressive with the EQ. Um, aggressive as in we're going to really go after the kick now and we're going to add that kind of punch that we want um, to come through because whether or not you're a hip hop or a pop listener, um, one of the most important aspects is is the kick, is the punch. You know, people want to be you know bumping it in their car. They want the car to shake. Um, so this is going to kind of help us do that without you know overwhelming the listener. One of the most common things that at least I see, especially working at the Stu in Lancaster, some of these guys will come in and their immediate reaction is to do this. And it's to really push the sub and yeah and yes that sounds good in a studio setting because we have subwoofers we have all this stuff that really like allows it to move around the room if you were to play this over you know a laptop over a phone even in headphones it'd be so overwhelming that it would detract from the actual song itself um so and we can actually just see that as an example here Even though we can't hear exactly what that low end is doing through there, we can hear just from the, the audio distortion that, you know, it's, it's not good business and we're grabbing too much of it, you know, moving forward into that more additive side. Um, and then for really the rest of the rest of the bands here, you're just trying to give a slight boost to everything. So everything except for the sub, really, we're trying to give a little bit of a boost to. Again, this is kind of staging us for when we're using our multi-presser because it's going to give our multi-presser something more to grab onto um, without, you know, completely squashing the beat itself and losing a lot of the actual characteristics of it. Cool. Speaking of multi-pressers, um, you really want to get light with, with the multi-presser, especially using Logix, and this is for Logix in particular. Um, Logix is extremely aggressive, I found. Um, it kind of banks on the side of being more of a, a gain plugin at times if you decide you know to keep the um, keep the ratios and stuff pretty low on the actual you know compression side of things. So really what I'm going to be using here is I'm going to be using this gain change a lot up in the top. Because when I go for the final mix down after I get the, the vocals and all that, I'm going to be adding another layer of compression. So I would definitely would experiment moving between some of these parameters down here for what we want our threshold to be. Um, you know, but always move forward in the mindset that, you know, if you're creating a mix down, which is separate from actually creating a master, um, you really want to try and, you know, compress it slightly at the end. It's not going to be a lot, but it's going to be enough to kind of pull everything dynamically just slightly closer. Uh, so the actual volume setting and mastering process isn't as as much of a pain. Um, so cool. So we're going to come in and we're going to listen to particularly our sub range. So we're just going to listen to even though I can't really hear a whole lot of it, and now I know how you guys may not be able to hear a whole lot of it through um, your laptops or phones or however you're watching it. Um, really what we're looking for is we're looking for a little bit more add to that sub. So just like we didn't add any during the EQ, we kind of did more of a shape because this is where we're gonna actually do. Because as I increase the gain change here, the way I have my parameters set, it's going to, give me more of the sub sound, but it's not going to extend beyond the parameters that I set and that shaping that I did, especially in this first sub region. 
because we can already see there was there was already a lot of sub present in this beat to begin with um partially because this beat sounded like it was unmastered as a youtube beat uh, which will most likely be the case with what you run into so moving on to our next set This is where we're gonna start hearing kind of the kick. We're gonna start hearing, especially start the, the high end of the kick. We're gonna start hearing that. Um, and if we really, if it's not in the range that we want it, we can always move our parameters throughout here. Um, so like how I like to sit this around, you know, 60 Hertz, kind of like where a majority of the sub is gonna be lying, especially if you have a beat that's using a lot of 808s um, and et cetera, a lot of the, the lower part um, the lot of the warm part is going to rest kind of down in that 60 hertz. Um, so I, I kind of sit it there. And then when it comes to the, the, the high stuff, I kind of want to grab using this second band. I want to grab the top end of the kick as well, try and cover all of the octaves for the kick. Because um, especially with this one, for this particular song, it has a lot of high end punch to it. So kind of then rolling back and speaking in the terms of like, if this was say a drum set kick, this would be the equivalent of the mic being closer to the beater um, versus kind of being more outside of the sound hole or outside of the shell, kind of more in front of the kick itself. Um, I'm gonna try and get both of those sounds kind of closer together on their own right. Um, We'll have to play around that kind of natural um, or rather unnatural um, sound distortion that was already, you know, in the beat from the, from the get go. Because for some reason, people think that distortion on kick sounds good. I really don't think it does, but you know, whatever. Um, cool. So moving on to our next band. This is where all of our high end is going to be. This is where I would say a majority of you know the the vocals, anything that's really going to interject with the vocals is going to be sitting. Um, so you really want to kind of be careful with this area. Um, you know, you might have to come back to this once we integrate the vocals and kind of figure out you know how much of this do I really want to compete with the with the vocals itself, especially with those effects on it, um, you know, versus, you know, do I want this to be more, more vacant so I can maybe add more than what's already there. And if you could guess our, our last one is going to contain all of our high end stuff. which really I'm not gonna mess with. And usually you don't wanna mess with it um, for the, the reason that you know, we're about to move to right now, which is gonna be taking the high end and spreading it out and really creating that sonic picture. Um, if you were to really mess with this and increase it, you could kind of compromise how effective that actual spread could be, um, as well as how clear the, the high end will be in contrast with those vocals, because you want the high end and that vocal to kind of sit side by side, um, especially, you know, in songs that have really intricate uh, hi-hat patterns um, that could interlace with the, the performer's cadence, etc. So cool. So again, this is going to be kind of a real minimal change from what's already there, but we'll kind of flip back and forth and hopefully you might be able to hear a little bit of it. Um, of what it's actually doing, but this is where you're actually going to hear the entire beat kind of get closer together and kind of feel a little bit more contained, a little bit more produced. Um, cool, cool beans. So 
Now we're moving on to the fun part. So, just like we didn't touch this track beforehand. Sorry. So the reason we didn't do any of this secondary EQing, multi-pressing onto the original beat audio track itself is because we want to still take what we did here with our kind of framework for this beat and we want to now send it to two separate auxiliary tracks that we're going to use to take this high end and move it. Um, so first thing you want to do is you want to set up two tracks, two auxiliary tracks, and you want to send them pre-fader. It is extremely important that they're sent pre-fader, not post-fader or um, post-pan, as Logic gives you some settings for. Um, so pre-fader is what you want to do, and you want to send them at full unity over. Because essentially what we're going to do is we're going to split this beat, its signal, into two other parts. And we're going to keep them mono so that we have the ability to send them both left and right. Um, and we're going to kind of work out the high end. So really what I'm going to be looking at is I'm going to be looking at these guys right here. So when I really mean take out everything but the high end, I really mean take out everything but the high end. So really pull, you know, if you're using a high pass filter, scoop that thing all the way up to like 2K, 4K, depending on whatever beat you have. Um, or how much of that low, not low end, how much of that high end you want to integrate. So if say you really like the high end of this really nice like female vocal part that might be going on in the background of the beat, try and find where that high is without grabbing too much of the high mids. Because um, essentially what the end product of this is going to do is it's not only going to send it to the side, but it's going to add that kind of high end sparkle on either sides of the ears that sometimes you'll get um, from some of these hip hop tracks. Um, cool. So cut everything out except for the high end and we're going to boost the high end up a decent amount because um, what we're going to fish this through then is we're going to fish this through an exciter which is going to take really the high really really high stuff so probably above our 12,000 15,000 hertz range and kind of elevate it and bring it out, which is going to add that kind of silvery effect that I just mentioned. Cool. And we're going to do that to both sides. So both of these are exactly the same. You want to try and do the exact same thing for both both sides. Um, now, a question you might be asking is, well, if you do both, if you know you have two of the identical thing, you throw it to both sides, won't it still sound like it's in the center? Yes, uh, for the most part, yes, unless you know you you add some sort of um, uh, change to one of them, it will it will kind of you know sound like it's still in the middle. So just like I had mentioned before, we're going to add our exciters. Really, you want to try and keep it high. You don't want to try and integrate this down into like your high mids or anything really lower than say like 9K. Um, I like to sit mine relatively high, probably around 10,000 at the lowest, 10,000 Hertz. Um, and then you want to kind of play with the harmonics to kind of see, you know, how much, how many layers of this high end do I want to really move? Um, and then that's going to give us this kind of high, kind of shrill kind of sound, which is what we really want to do. Cool. So now the really interesting part, and this is the part that I kind of messed around with a lot a while ago. So you're going to take this high end and you're going to completely flip the phase of it on both of them. So what this is gonna do is this is going to now fully separate from the high end in the beat itself. Um, so remember that you know we didn't take the hi-hats, we didn't take any of that high end from the original beat track itself. We completed a duplicate of it 
We expanded it to both sides, and now we're going to be running them in parallel with one another. So by flipping the phase of this, not only am I really isolating that high end and making it even thinner than it was before, but it's also now completely separating itself from the actual bead. So if you kind of try and imagine this, because I mean, Grant and some, some other people who've heard me try to explain how I mix stuff would know, I'm kind of crazy sometimes. So I like to imagine things kind of in depth, like as a visual depth and, you know, side by side comparisons. So you want to try to think of, you know, here's your first beat high end. Here's the stuff that we just duplicated right now. They're in parallel with one another. They're riding on top, they're stacking. That's cool. As we flip the phase and the further towards, you know, fully flipping it, we get the further away they start to start to be. And that means the further away they're going to be when moving from, you know, right to left. So if I imagine my beat straight here in the center, right, as I flip the phase, now it's kind of moving back towards the back side of my head. If you're wearing headphones, you would hear it move to the back side of your head. Um, and if anybody has tried like the kind of um, polyphonic uh, sound exercises that sometimes they have on YouTube, the ones where you can kind of, you know, imagine or close your eyes and it sounds like somebody's shaving your head as it goes around or it sounds like a, a wasp or something is flying around. This is kind of playing a little bit on that, on that effect. And even though we're not fully you know, wrapping this completely around the head. This is going to give us enough separation that it's going to make our vocals be perceived to be louder without me actually having to turn up the gain. So let's kind of listen to what this sounds like with it flipped and with it not flipped. It's actually an easier way. You won't hear too much of a change when they're on their own. You might hear a little bit of um, kind of a, a frequency crossover, which by frequency crossover, I don't mean cro the same crossovers that we use when we're explaining um, different EQing techniques. What it'll sound like is it'll sound like both of your high end tracks swap when they really don't. That's just the way for some reason your ears perceive it, or at least mine do. Um, so with the actual beat itself. You can kind of hear audibly that the high end actually dropped. And the reason for that is we, of course, we flipped the phase. So we, now we have two of the exact things stacking. But if you were to really listen to this with headphones on or through a really good um, kind of monitoring source that will allow you to hear kind of stereo imaging, um, you'll actually hear that high end move and separate. So now it will be more closer to the size of your head versus straight in front, which is why in this setting, we kind of hear um, the high end kind of drop and almost disappear completely. Um, this is going to, A, it's going to create this kind of void in between where that actual phase shift was and the rest of the beat. It's going to create a kind of hole that we're going to stick the, um, the effects that are already planted on the voice because they're quite high and they're quite annoying, if I'm being frank. So, so yeah, so kind of taking everything off of this beat, just so you can hear the before and the after. Kind of here now that you know doing all of that brought a little bit more character a little bit more color 
to our beat. Um, some might argue it adds some saturation. So, you know, give or take whether or not you believe that. Um, but it definitely gives the beat a little bit more presence and it makes it sound like, you know, it makes it sound like it wasn't just ripped off of YouTube. You know, it gives it a little bit more depth, um, which in turn will make it easier for you to take the vocals, no matter if it's, you know, in this setting where the, um, the effects are already applied to it, or if it was a dry vocal, you know, how are we going to make that really sit with, you know, the rest of the, the rest of the track and create one cohesive song. Cool. So now let's move on to the opposite end of stuff. So now we're going to look at the vocal part on its own. So like I mentioned before, the vocal part already has the effects on it and they're quite wild. Um, this is somebody who uses a lot of auto-tune. Um, so it definitely is, you know, it definitely is a little bit intimidating to look at off the bat. My bitch hold me down for two bits, yeah, buy whatever she want. And I'm smoking rice, but I don't give a fuck what you tryna say, you ain't hitting this blind. I ain't never been a rack, better check my background. I ain't never let a rat who was around come around. So one thing we can also hear in there is we're starting to hear a little bit of kind of artifact stuff, which either, hello, you can go away. Um, which could be, you know, caused from two different factors. It could be caused from the actual plugins themselves and kind of a misuse of it, or it could be, you know, something that got lost in trans, uh, transport from moving it from USB to, to not, because I've noticed with a couple really dense, you know, tracks that some people try and export um, with some of these producers putting, you know, up, upwards of nine to 10 different plugins on the one track at one time. Sometimes you can get a little bit of audio um, distortion, a little bit of like, you know, audio artifacts that could show up. So we do hear a couple of those in here, which isn't the end of the world. We can definitely still, you know, use them either to our advantage um, or we can, you know, try and remedy it either with, you know, some, uh, some volume leveling or et cetera. So just like we do with the beat, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a framework. And since we already have the effects, you know, out of our hands, it's already on the track, we need to kind of work aggressively. We need to figure out, you know, what exactly needs to go from these, what absolutely needs to just exit the sound. So Surprisingly, there was a lot of low clutter from what I heard when I first listened to this. So there's a lot of kind of just low clutter and there's a couple of moments in here where you can actually hear the room itself that was recorded in. So you can hear the low end coming from, I don't know if the, the ISO booth or whatever, or the control room, wherever it was coming through the walls and you can hear a little bit of that bleed. And because it already has effects on it, the effects just expand upon it. Um, so even if you're in a situation where you don't really hear a whole lot of, you know, lows, really like low frequencies, or even in some cases, um, any real low mids, you should probably still do it just in case. Because, you know, with some plugins out there, um, like especially a reverb that I use quite often, Realm, I've seen a lot of my friends use um, a lot of stuff from the isotopes, especially if somebody is using one of those adaptive EQs. They sometimes they can add in some things that maybe weren't present before. So this is just kind of a safety precaution um, to make sure that, you know, all that work that we just did on the beat and all that staging we did both, you know, stereo wise and frequency wise, um, we're not you know, causing more problems and we don't want to have to go back to the beat and we don't want to like, you know, have to tweak things from there. Um, so, yeah, so kind of find a nice spot where you can just kind of hear the most present low end starting to roll. Um, and then, you know, taking that kind of real kind of squawkiness, you know, the real, real muddy part of the voice and taking that out. Um, Cause especially in this case, a lot of the kind of squawkiness that comes from 
this vocal is because of the auto tune. This blind, I ain't never been a rag, better check my background. I ain't never let a rag who was around come around. You say you will take what look, we in town. No, we not like it, best the pack and blowing down. Five, five, six up in this bitch and it blow whoever down. Put a beam up in his nose, he get So we can kind of, you know, hear that, you know, with adding that real, like, real sharp cut there that, you know, we're making it a little bit cleaner, taking a little bit of that kind of low mid out, especially the low mid out of what the auto tune is actually grabbing. Um, you know, it's, it's making it sound a little bit thinner, which is making it sound a little bit cleaner. Um, and that's kind of like a really important thing that, you know, if, if you do get the opportunity to work, you know, within the hip hop or even the pop scene, especially in hip hop with some of these artists trying to mimic, you know, these popular mumble rappers and stuff like that. A lot of the times you want to try and stage their voice more bang towards the high mids um, and presence kind of range because it's going to help give a little bit more presence, a little bit more punch. Because um, essentially when you when you add all these effects, when you add all these, you know, all this auto tuning, all this stuff to your vocals, you're essentially creating, you know, a secondary instrumental track almost to a degree, you know, and in this case, since we can't get in and really mess with the dry vocal at all, I have to treat this like it's two instrumental tracks and kind of run them side by side. Um, which is why you see some similarities between you know the way we cut this versus the way we cut cut it over here with the um with the beat cool beans so moving forward just like we did before if you take something i always mix by if you take something away you add something as well so that you know you never kind of break this equilibrium position where you know one thing is way out of proportion whereas the other thing is not so I kind of found this kind of happy place here, um, you know, in his voice where, you know, since, since he is a male um, and, you know, since he is, you know, con considered pre-adultery male, um, you know, he was 15 years old. I didn't have to go super, super low and reliant on that. Um, and if you're interested, there's a couple really cool um, studies and there's a couple of really good visual aids that you can find out there that help show like the difference frequency wise between mixing female vocals versus male vocals and then also if you're working with someone like a minor who's under 18 dependent on their voice a lot of the time you would treat them differently from their um from their older versions of themselves which is kind of interesting um i definitely would recommend like trying to look up and look a little bit more into that because it, it helps not just in hip-hop but it helps in you know everything else as well um which essentially is what i'm doing here so again kind of creating this really nice kind of taper just moving off into my next band um which really what i'm doing here kind of around this 2.3 hertz 2000 hertz range is I'm just adding a little bit of punch, like it's a little bit more push through so it helps stand out a little bit. That's where kind of the, the high gloss of your, um, most of your auto tunes. Um, in this case, since we have the reverb and the delays on the vocals as well, that's where a lot of them are gonna cross over and really you know give us the advantage to pull that out to help the vocals a little bit. Um, because really, like we're working in the realm of perceived volume versus actual volume. Um, so something may sound louder to us, but we haven't turned the volume up on it. Um, so that's a very like important concept, especially within the hip hop world, because you can get really out of control, just raising the volume on everything. And then all of a sudden you're out of headroom and you're not even close to finishing the mix down. And now you're in trouble. Um, you know, so kind of, you know, trying to spend a lot more time creating frameworks within your EQs with, you know, always thinking forward to what your next thing is, what your end goal is going to be, um, is extremely important and is a huge recommendation for me. So kind of listening to the vocals with and without. 
Expose your clown. You told me that you love me, will help me when I'm down. I'll be dripping you in fashion just to see you smile. Uh, yeah, I fucked up, but don't forget about the shit you done did. Gotta grow up, cause we not kids, and know we started like kids. Yeah, I like forever, will you hold me down through them beds? And you can ask about me in my city, no, I don't miss. Uh, don't get me started. They asked me if my party, I said. So, especially the one thing we can really hear is we can really hear the the delay especially if you listen to the delay itself when we add those that kind of eq framework on top of it you can hear that kind of subside a little bit you can hear it sound a little bit more contained because we've taken a little bit more of its actual you know core out um and we've kind of created this nice little cocoon for it to live in um moving forward onto our compression um and etc. So neat. So speaking of compression, real easy. Um, you kind of want to apply a very soft compress compressor on here. Nothing really, really drastic. It's kind of a misconception that especially if you're working with some auto tune wrappers, um, that you want to use a lot of compression on it. That's definitely not the case. You want to treat them more so like a very dynamic vocalist than you would, you know, a, a rapper or something like that um, because once that auto tune is on their voice you treat that as their actual vocal tone itself and it'll it'll make you know the the end product a lot cleaner and a lot more cohesive than it would be if you over compressed it and that sounds very kind of you know out of control so really where i like to go is i usually i make sure my knee is as soft as it can go um, so I try not to really stick with a sharp knee because I really want this compressor to be barely noticeable. Adding just a little bit of um, dynamic control on this, especially in this setting where we have all those other delays and stuff that are you know being treated at the same time as our dry vocal. Um, we want to make sure that we're we're grabbing all of that. Um, keep your attacks low. Keep your your releases somewhat on the lower end because um, the more you open that up kind of the more um, you're going to hear kind of reverb stacking if it was already there uh, beforehand when it was stemmed out um, this is something that we we really don't want to stand out too much our goal is to still make the actual lyrics itself um, present within the mix I say Harley, uh, I was moving retarded I had to stop and tell myself I was sorry Yeah, I'm trying to make it out, see him, then we staking out That means bring the bangers out, catch you, leave me lame down Now I am pray, but look, I'm praying now You said that I'm ass, but look, what you saying now? And we still drive stoves like rentals We are still put a nigga in the spittle Fuck that, we gonna put him with so like I said, as we're adding things here Remember, our goal isn't to create, you know, a new, you know color contrast a new experience for this it's to clean up what's already there um, so the more things we begin to add we want to hear the effects of those things less and less as we move forward um, because you know at the end of the day yes there's a lot more production in this say than an, an acoustic guitar and single vocal track um, but we don't want to move so far into the realm of overproducing something and making it audibly sound like it's overproduced. Um, one of my good friends that you know I attempted to work with in a studio setting, they had that issue. They would have you know twelve plugins on like every single track, and he'd be like, "Well, it sounds good." Yeah. Well, it doesn't. It it sounds very overproduced. It sounds very you know just not human <laughs> at all and you know even with you know the annoying auto tune that sometimes some of these guys use we still want to try and humanize a little bit of it um as we move forward so cool so that's our eq that's our compression on there um the next thing i do is i'll do one last set of framework on this because now that i compressed it i'm going to now you know be a little bit more um pay a little bit more attention to how the high end especially is gonna be. So same kind of generalized stuff that we've been doing. Um, I still heard a little bit of you know the beat. There's still some low shaping within this that I just wanna make sure is, is completely not there and isn't gonna contribute 
to anything clashing with the beat and that kind of spatial profile I've created for it. Um, so really it's kind of this finding the, the heart of his voice, um, which I found is kind of around the 870, 900 hertz range. Um, not quite as, as low as say uh, an adult male would be, which usually is between you know 500 and 700 typically. Um, you know, unless you're, you're somebody who naturally has a higher voice or if you're working with like a counter tenor or something like that. Um, so you can kind of hear, let me take these off real quick. Where's man's at? Smack a nigga with the heat with them bands at. When the man's at. And I just keep it a hundred. Do you really love her? You really love her. Uh, and I'ma keep it a hundred. So that's kind of what's going to give, you know, just a little bit more, um, give it a little bit more of a stance in the beat. Similar to how over here in this EQ, we kind of boosted it up around the 2K, 2.3 range. You know, we're now we're grabbing the lower, lower part of that, almost moving to the exact kind of lower octave just underneath it. Um, it's kind of what we're grabbing. Um, and the reason I do this separately, and I don't just do this all in one EQ chain, is that framework. So thinking of building a framework for every single thing I'm doing leading to the next, um, that doesn't mean that you need to add a plugin, EQ it, and then add another plugin, and then EQ it again and prep for the next thing. Um, but especially like with this, I have to kind of chip away slowly at this kind of outrageously out of control effect chain that is ingrained onto this vocal track. Um, doing it this way is going to kind of help me maintain clarity, if not get more clarity out of it um, simultaneously, while of course, you know, adding some some fun little stuff in there. So cool. So now I'm going to attack that presence range. I'm going to attack 4K almost right on the dot. Um, which is going to take a little bit of that kind of sharpness out of it because when listening to the vocals, especially listening to it at mixing volumes um, through speakers or through headphones, you can kind of get that sense that you know this this might be a little too too sharp, too sharp of a sound to how to soften that, take a little bit of presence out. Um, sometimes, especially with with that auto tune mixed with these delays and the reverbs you kind of get this very brash kind of high mid presence sound that sometimes you just need to alleviate just a little bit. Cool. And then really we're gonna roll off the real high end stuff um, because one of the things that we can do and you might've actually just heard it in here was there was actually some um, really bad audio artifacts. It was, it was almost like a clipping kind of effect where we kind of heard some noise kind of get interjected. Um, that wasn't done on our end, that was done on, over and before. So one of the things we can do since that is ingrained on the track is we can minimize it a little bit and then pray that the beat itself will cover it up enough. Um, because in that setting, unless you're using um, a plugin that runs through and re-renders tracks, you really won't be able to really get rid of it unless you could, you know, contact whoever sent you the stems and see if you could get the, uh, the original stems back. Um, sweet. Moving forward, we're just going to throw a de-esser for the same purpose. Um, but also the de-esser is going to help us with some of the real tedious artifacts, you know, and I'm also a person who uses plugins as they're not intended to be used. So in this sense, I'm using a de-esser not to alleviate S's because really there aren't a whole lot of them. Um, it's more so to help contain some of that stuff that is unfortunately ingrained into the track itself. And really it does a good job of it. I definitely would experiment playing around with using um, plugins like a de-esser, like some other um, dynamic processors um, in fashions that maybe they aren't traditionally thought of being used for. 
um because we can definitely hear like throughout here it definitely helps and it, it helps kind of soften those s's that do come through but really it helps kind of minimize the amount of artifacts that really are going to stick out and are really going to be kind of a, a detriment to to your final mix um sweet so let's listen to the vocals now with the beat as it was prior and then we're going to turn it on and we're going to see what exactly we did to it cool yeah so like i said before it's not uh so much of a drastic change that you know we can really hear like you know as soon as this plugin activates there's this huge the drop off there's this huge addition of whatever xyz is that you added to it um, where it just kind of cleans it up a little bit and makes it a little bit more listenable. You can understand more of what he was saying versus um, before in the reference track. You can't really, you can hear what he's saying, but there's a lot of high end interjection. Versus what we have now. And a lot of that is, you know, due to like what we did with the beat, with taking the high end, separating it, and moving it somewhere else. That that gap that we've created, and the gap that I had mentioned, that really, you know, it it does do a lot more than it may appear, especially listening to it through through here, through a um, through like a laptop speaker or through some headphones or something like that. Um, listening to this in a studio space or through your monitoring system will really make a difference. Even listening to this track in the car, you could really hear, you know, I had two mixes, one where I did do this high-end separation, one that I didn't do the high-end separation. Listen to them back to back and the difference really was huge. The clarity was way better on the one with that high end separated. Um, and we're actually going to use a very similar thing with the ad libs itself. Um, so our ad libs are very kind of minimal. But again, they have just this really washy, really wide kind of reverb kind of effect, real wide spatial effect on it. Um, you know, so I really am going to kind of use that to finish off and kind of add the last little bits of, um, of filling into, in, into the actual scope of the song. Um, also, if you heard in there, it almost sounds like he burps in the middle of his ad lib. Which I think is kind of hilarious. Um, so, so yeah. So really, the ad libs are kind of useless in this sense. There's so much going on that really they're not not too noticeable. Um, so just like I did before, I'm going to create kind of a framework that mimics kind of this secondary one that I did. Um, you know, for the same exact reasons that I mentioned before, like. Really what I'm doing is I'm just trying to, to clean it up. I'm trying to make room for some other things and then, you know, staying by that rule of whatever I take away, I need to add. And at this point, I've kind of added everything I want to. So now it's, you know, just about making sure I'm not adding too much and extending beyond it. Because when we do the final mix down, um, you know, we, we want to make sure that what we're mixing down isn't you know, ruining everything that we just spent time mixing.
And then very similarly, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this in a, um, in a left end in a mono, as you can see. So uh, I definitely recommend like if you're going to play around with messing with the phase on some tracks and trying to listen to like what would happen if I switched the phase on this or switched it on that, try and play around with some of these presets. Because one thing I do like, you know, give credit to, to Logic is some of its um, presets are really good places to start thinking about, you know, different sounds. Um, and, you know, I'm just flipping the ad libs onto like the left side. I'm not flipping both both sides of it, which is going to kind of shift everything almost diagonally, which is hard to really explain. It's just easier to, to listen to it. So if you're curious about it, you can contact me and I can you know give you the final track. I do have permission to distribute it if you want to hear what the final sounds like, because it's a lot easier to hear it in the final mastered version of it than even in the mixed down one that we're about to finish here. Um, so, so yeah, so without getting into the real, the, the final bit, which is the mixed down portion, this is kind of what we're left with now. So you might be able to hear a little bit like the ad libs at this point, they're kind of just adding this little um, this little filler to the backside. So wherever you hear kind of holes in the uh, the vocals and then with the effects that are attached to those vocals, that's where you're going to hear a little bit of those ad libs um, interject and you know kind of fill that void. And that was the goal. I want the song to kind of be so cohesive that it it helps itself rather than me having to tell it, hey, do this, hey, do that. Hey, I want this place to be raised here. I want the beat to really, you know, tell the vocals, hey, the vocals are here. And I want the vocals to be like, hey, I'm here, listen to me. Oh, I, I ducked out, here are my ad libs, or here are my doubles in some cases to help, you know, fill that in. Um, so cool. So moving into our mix down, one thing I definitely recommend if you're not too confident on creating mix downs for say demos or just mix downs in general, play around with some of these channel settings. Um, now I have reprogrammed some of mine. Um, they're slightly different from the typical Logic Pro ones, but they still maintain the same names. One I would recommend is the Broadcast Ready one. Um, it's a good place to start. I would not recommend just throwing it on and walking away from it saying it's done. Um, you wanna put it down, you wanna disable everything and work through one at a time. Um, what exactly each piece is doing because it does a good job giving you a general framework of hey here's what you might want to think about doing and then you can kind of take stuff out put it in as needed um, you know because no, no one's going to be mad at you there's there's no such thing as cheating um, you know in, in especially mixing and making music sound good um, so here for our compressor almost the same things we did before and i think i mentioned this earlier on you want to try and make very very slight gradual compression um onto your your final mix down in this sense you want to use a compressor because this is very um very hectic in a sense that there's a lot of effects going on um you know, between the, the ad libs, between the, the main vocals with the auto tune, the delay throws, etc. cetera. Um, and then even some of the stuff that's going on in the beat, because there's some really nice um, kind of vocal ad lib in the beat that we want to kind of stick out as well, because it adds another sense of uh, a melodic feature to the track. Um, so you're kind of going to see a mimic almost of what was done over here, just with a a, a different compressor and a um, uh, kind of a different a different usage of it. So like for our main vocals, which is this one here on the left, we're, you really want to try and use your vintage uh, FET or your studio FET. The Platinum Digital is okay um, if you're going to use Logic Stock. Now, typically like me, I, I'm, a, I'm a CLA person. So if I'm using like, you know, 
plugins that aren't stock plugins. I would use like a CLA or something like that. Something really soft that can handle handle stuff real soft. SSL has some really nice ones that are really um really good at working through those. Um, but you'll see that you know their settings are are very similar. Very very shallow um, ratios. A really high threshold or low threshold, depending on how you think of it. Very, very soft knee, low attacks, um, medium to low releases, depending on you know the track you have. Um, and then kind of just moving forward, this is just kind of, at this point, you're doing some cleanup work um, using one last set of EQ. Promise it's the last EQ, I think. Let me double check. Yeah, last EQ. <laughs> um, so, you know, just listening to the mix itself and kind of seeing, okay, what, what could be just a little bit more? What could be cut out a little bit? Um, in this case, you can kind of see I'm still kind of going after that 4K range just a little bit because of the, the interaction between the, um, the high mids and the presence and the beat and the high mids and the presence that are uh, exonerated in the, um, the vocals with all the effects on it. Um, and then kind of like saying, okay, maybe it needs to be a little bit warmer because now that I added the vocals, um, I would like to just, you know, get a little bit more low presence from everything, um, you know, since we took a lot of it out in the cleaning process. Um, so I kind of add that here and then, you know, any other places as needed as we're moving forward. Um, I'm going to throw on another multipressor. This one acting different from the previous one. Um, whereas the other one we used for the beat to kind of contain it, this one we're just going to use as a traditional multipressor in different elements. So pulling up, you know, through everything, you know, what do we want from the lows, which this time you see I staged it a little higher. So now it's a bit, you know, more in the 120, a bit more in the bass range, um, kind of moving closer to the low mids, which I cover um, kind of more broadly here in our second band. Um, and then from the third band up, it's mimicking what I did with the beat, trying to keep things kind of consistent. You don't need to perfectly overlay your multipressors. There are a couple producers that I know that who use this a similar style and who use multipressors more than say some outboard stuff. Um, they'll maybe say that you need to make your multipressors identical every time you use them. That's not necessarily the case um, when working with, you know, tracks that are already consolidated. Um, and yeah, so moving forward, this is a free plugin. This is OTT, if some of you don't know. Um, it has kind of a, you know, hit or miss reputation, depending on, you know, if you've used it before or not. But in this sense, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use it to kind of darken the song just a little bit. So if we listen to the original reference track. Remember one of the initial comments I made in the beginning was I said, there's a lot of high in. It's really, really high. Right, so it's, it's really, really high. Um, there's a lot of high stuff going on and overall it's it's staged at a very high frequency. So I'm gonna use OTT, which is a, um, it's called an upward downwards compressor. So you can really kind of control, you know, how much it swings either side. Um, and I'm gonna kind of, you know, finagle it a bit so I can take some of that high end out without compromising, you know, everything that I've mixed. In my city, no, I don't miss. Uh, don't get me started. They asked me if my party, I say Harley. Uh, I was moving retarded. I had to stop and tell myself, oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm trying to make it out. See him, then we stake it out. Let me bring the bangers out. Quick, you leave me laying down. Now, yeah, I pray, but look, I'm praying now. You should... And you can also hear with using that plugin, now there's a big separation. Right? So now, kind of the low mids and some of the upper mids kind of pressed back a little bit more, which allows the vocals to come up. That is a result of all of that staging, all that framework that we did here, here, even in the beat. That's the reason I do it. 
because you know when I use something like OTT, which is you know a multi-band upwards and downwards compressor alongside a a wide a wide scope kind of multi-presser, it's going to sit automatically sit everything in a position where you know like I said the song is going to do the heavy lifting itself. You're going to allow it to you know almost essentially mix itself um, once you do you know all the framework and all the building you're teaching it how to you know be a song because <laughs> trust me with some of the artists i've worked with um hello i didn't open notice you opened again um with some of the artists that i work with who maybe aren't as experienced sometimes they need to be taught you know how to make that how to you know make a cohesive song um cool and then sometimes i'll i'll add on um an additional exciter, especially with the stuff that's thrown away on the outside. If you feel like there's still not enough quote unquote excitement um, in your high end on the outsides, um, you can you can use it. I'm kind of on the fence whether or not I use it. So I keep it there, but I'll like bypass it and turn it on as I as I need it. Um, I'll also add on um, uh, an adaptive limiter. I'll kind of mimic what potentially a, a mastering engineer would do. Um, like creating a ceiling, kind of trying to level match it or get it up to a volume that I want um, for because in this case, the artist wanted to this to be kind of like a demo track. Um, so he wasn't going to send it to a mastering engineer. So I brought it close without going through a, a, an official, pro, like professionalized uh, mastering chain. Um, and then the last plugin that I use, which is also free. I really like this one. It's the Yulian loudness meter. It's one of the easier loudness meters to really view. Um, this one and the one that uh, Blue Cat also um, provides. Um, and really looking through it, I'm really trying to target around minus 14, uh, minus 15. Sometimes if you're working with um, artists who have a lot more of like quote unquote a city beat or do more of like drill beats and the real fast kind of harder style stuff. Um, you might want to bank more towards the minus 12, minus 10. Um, I know in modern pop music, minus nine sometimes is where you want to sit it before it goes through the whole um, process and goes out to all the distributors. Um, but in this sense, minus 14 is usually, usually a good bet um, to start off with, especially if you're an in-training mastering engineer. Um, so yeah, so so that's all the work that I would typically do on a track like this. Um, so we're going to now listen to the reference. So what we kind of started with, and then we're going to listen to now ours, and we're going to listen to the differences. Let's go to a different part of the song. I'm tired of hearing the same thing over and over again. They like so to be like, and I'll keep it on me. You think cause you got a gun that you a demon, homie. You ain't no demon, homie. And I've been with the game for a while I told my baby I just want to see you smile And that fake shit really not my style You touch my you told me I was foul uh, Do you love me how you say you do? If you my man, you got it on you, is you gonna shoot? And if I was you and you was me, would you do what I do? They wasn't fucking with me, now they acting brand new My bitch hold me down for two bitches Yeah, buy whatever she want And they ain't smoking rights But I don't give a fuck what you trying to say You ain't hitting this blind I ain't never been right my back girl, I ain't never let her right who was around come around but You say you old okay, well look, we in town No, we not like it, but the back and blow me down I fuck some up in this bitch and then blow whoever down Yeah, so yeah, so again, some of the big changes that you heard Really the things that I went for as I made it a little darker um, So as a full track, it doesn't have as much high end And because of that, the vocals are a little clearer the effects do their job. They're not taking over what's there. And I'm essentially, I've taken what I originally couldn't manipulate and I've now manipulated it and I've integrated it into the beat and created, you know, this kind of full spread effect that originally was all just stuck in the middle and you couldn't do anything with. Um, so yeah, so that's my process for how I'd work through something, you know, that, you know, it, it only started with three tracks, everything was already consolidated. Um, and I know I talked to, talked to the manager of the artists, um, 
who who gave this song and he said that the other two engineers they gave it to said that because it was a youtube beat because you know the stems already had the effects on them they couldn't do anything and obviously they lied <laughs> so so yeah so that's what i got um if you guys have any questions please please ask away um i know i kind of moved kind of quickly through a couple things um but but yeah so so yeah that's what i got all right thank you paul any questions from anybody i know it's very boring stuff Well, cool. If nobody has any questions, I think we're pretty good here for this meeting, so I'm going to stop recording.